Hello, everybody, and welcome to Digital Photography's uh, three lecture series. We are thrilled to have photographer Fran Foreman as our guest speaker tonight. Fran holds an MFA in graphic design and photography from Boston University. She has worked as a senior designer with AOL Time Warner and has extensive experience in branding, print, and signage for corporate arts and retail establishments, CD-ROMs for books, museum installations, book cover illustrations, animations, multimedia, and web design. She is currently a resident scholar at the Women's Studies Research Center at Brandeis University and teaches digital collage at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Her work is represented by Panopticon Gallery in Boston and Susan Spiritus Gallery in California. In 2012, her series Le Cirque Imaginaire won first place in fine art collage from the Prix de la Photographie, Paris. In 2011, she was exhibited at the Lichouy International Photo Festival. In 2010 and 2008, she was awarded first place and second place at the International Photography Awards and an honorable mention at the Julia, Julia Margaret Cameron Awards. Her work has been included in numerous solo and group exhibitions nationally and is in the collections of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Uh, so please help me welcome Fran to our lecture series. So, the photographer tries to tell a story with an image that freezes a moment in time. I try to tell a story too, but I make up the story by incorporating images from many places and times. I'm an artist who uses photographs. Some years ago, when I was entering the world of fine art photography, I attended a portfolio review in the hopes of securing gallery exhibitions and representations, or at the very least, some positive feedback. I met a well-known New York gallery owner who said to me, but this is not a photograph. So in preparing for this presentation, first, I thought I'd talk about this is the nomenclature, what is a photograph, relevant or important. Later, I'll talk about how I got to where I'm at now and how the art I make has been affected and not affected by new technologies. You'll see that my early drawings and doodles have informed the work that I'm doing now. I drew all the time. I doodled all the time as well. So now I'm wondering, is the art I'm making using these new technologies really all that different from those early drawings I did over a half a century ago? And what is the connection between my childish doodles, my early work as a psychiatric social worker and a graphic designer, and the art I'm creating now? My pictures are made with many tools, various cameras, scanners, paint, pastel, but they're composited in the digital saucepan. Is the fact that I'm using digital tools significant? What's the difference between a collage and a montage? Does it matter? And who cares if it's digital? These are photographs, photographs that are composited, and photographs that are manipulated. Just photographs? Is this art? And do labels really matter? I think it's about the image, the emotional, psychological response to the image. I combine, blend, juxtapose disparate elements and create new images from photographic sources. My images are composites, but first and foremost, they are images. I also want to be clear, my artwork doesn't derive from a vacuum. I'm indebted to all those who have come before me, and I want to acknowledge a few of them here. So in preparing for this presentation, I've learned that the work that I've done as a child, my experiments with different media, the early photographs, my studies of graphic design, history, sociology, and psychology, they've all led me to the work that I'm doing now. There have been some twists and turns in my artistic journey, but the journey is a process, and the process is a journey. As a child, I drew all the time and practiced getting the signals from my eyes and my brain into my right hand. Long before I began drawing with a camera, I was drawing with crayons. Drawing requires observation from life, from other photographs, from other artists. 
Only later did I discover that the camera for me is a way of drawing. I still draw, I just use other tools. I've always been drawing faces and eyes, and you'll see that I still do. When I was a child, I mimicked the style of my middle school comic books. And I was interested particularly in expressing human emotions. I looked at photographs as a source for my drawings, and I tried developing my own style. But I became frustrated that I couldn't adequately express myself sufficiently. In high school, I discovered other artists whose work made my head spin. Joseph Cornell created art that looked like toys. I loved his serendipitous confluences and seemingly chance encounters of fragments suggesting a specific object and how they would take on new meanings when they were placed in proximity. I was fascinated by his assemblages appropriating Renaissance portraiture, toys, seemingly arbitrary images, spheres, and birds. And I attempted to express myself and to imitate his art with collage art. I made paper collages using old family photographs, found objects from science and architectural magazines, colored paper and texture, and box assemblages. In the early 70s, I discovered photography. I began to see that photography could express emotion. For the first time, I understood that a good photograph is also a work of art. Prior to then, I'd assumed that a photograph was a document, a journalistic tool, which I looked at obsessively in Life or Look magazines or in The Family of Man. But it hadn't occurred to me that a good documentary photograph was also a work of art. That is, it elicited an emotional response that it called me back to look at it again and again and to feel something. I spent countless hours looking at photographs poring over every issue of Camera Magazine. I discovered Ralph Eugene Meatyard. And in doing so, I began to understand the image's poetry. I learned to appreciate the ecstasy of light and shadow, the use of blur to suggest movement, the human form to tell a story, and Dwayne Michaels, the image as a visual narrative evoking mystery, emotion, and the human psyche of mortality, of composition, symmetry, texture, and patterns of light and darks. This resonated with my prior years studying and working as a psychiatric social worker. With the photograph, in, my early, in the early 70s as I entered photography, with a photograph I could express more than I could in my drawings. It felt liberating. I could create a scene, tell a story, suggest a range of human emotions. I could suggest the passage of time. My interest in psychology also influenced my image making, in particular the use of masks and their implications. I was experimenting with the concept of time as mutable. Perhaps I was beginning to consider my own mortality. I was fascinated by the dramatic use of light and shadow, texture and shape. And I began to create a visual narrative playing with the concept of disappearance, of time passing. I was dissatisfied with the static nature of a still image. I wanted to suggest movement. How could a single image, a moment frozen, represent time moving back and forth from present to past and back to present? Rather than trying to stop time to freeze the moment, as Dwayne Michael said, I hope to suggest the non-linearity of time. And the realization that even the frame of the photograph is in sacrosanct that the confines of the photo's boundaries were actually arbitrary. If the figure goes out of the frame, can it suggest that she's moving away from the viewer? Is she both here and there at the same time? Here is a self-portrait with my drawing, and I'm moving out of the frame. In my experiments with sequences, I was beginning to understand that the still image freezes a moment in time, but the, sequent, the sequence also can suggest time passing. And the individual image can suggest a narrative. 
After spending several years in the darkroom, I shifted my priorities and received an MFA in graphic design. As Milton Glaser, one of your professors, has said, graphic design is the intersection of art and commerce, <coughs> and I needed to make a living. I was hired by the architect Ben Thompson to design banner and signage design for Faneuil Hall and Quincy Markets in Boston. This was in 1978. <coughs> And for fun, I constructed banners, including this eight-foot banner using vintage photographs. In 1977, Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket threatened to secede from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Of course, they needed branding. I designed their flag and then coined the phrase, nothing succeeds like secession. It became a national phenomenon, albeit short-lived. My husband and I became designers of restaurants their architecture, interiors, and graphics. In the 70s and 80s, I was engaged in branding, interiors, print, and typography. And as a graphic designer, I learned to visually communicate the strategy and services of the client. This meant that I needed to distill complex information to present it in a concise and visually compelling way. One could communicate the client's message with the use of typography, placement, color, and shape. And we did branding for many real estate companies, including logo designs for major corporations such as the Beacon Companies and their divisions. Understanding typography helps one appreciate the importance of the relationship of positive and negative space and the impetus for perfection. Similarly, in creating a digital piece of art, every pixel counts. We designed signage systems, emphasizing good typography for Boston landmark buildings. But I was a confirmed technophobe. I was disinterested and terrified by the computer. However, in 1989, when I was introduced to the computer as an art tool, as another way to make art, I embraced it as a substitute for my pencils. My only interest in using the computer was to draw. So I learned to draw with a mouse. I drew pictures that replicated the stylized drawings of my youth. 1992, this is a little bit embarrassing, but this was my first commercial use of Photoshop. I had a lot of fun. I hadn't yet learned that less is more. For this catalog cover, I tried every filter and blending effect in the arsenal of pre-layers Photoshop, and I even incorporated photos of my kids and the clients. I designed animated logos. CD-ROMs were the new platform. You probably haven't heard of CD-ROMs, but <laughs> in the 90s, they offered multimedia and hypertext links all on one disk. So I learned to create visually rich images within the limits of this format, which was small file size, 256 colors, index colors, this was created in 1994 to 1995. This CD-ROM was Penguin's first and only interactive CD-ROM electronic book. It was a harbinger of the rich literary and visual content so readily available today. This was the interactive menu with seven sections and a help menu, which was the Buddha icon. We designed video and audio samplers. We were way ahead of our time and compiled enormous amounts of data onto the single disk. The novel, The Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac, was the centerpiece of this CD-ROM. It was entirely hypertext with illustrations for all 34 chapters. And each illustration housed an Easter egg, which meant that you moused over part of an image and another image would appear. The slider at the bottom moved pages and chapters, and the text was completely hyper, hyperlinked. All 34 chapters of the Dharma Bums had photo composite illustrations. Printers were slow to catch up with the technology, so archival printing wasn't yet available. And few of my illustrations exist on paper larger than 8 by 10. And the inks then were not archival, so many of these that were printed on paper have faded. 
Moreover, the file size was too small, my computer was too slow, although it was a quadra, state of the art at the time, and there wasn't much that I could do other than create images for monitors. I was always trying to merge photography with painting, as for this CD-ROM with photo illustrations for a business strategic planning company. At the Strawberry Bank Museum in New Hampshire, an on-site installation celebrated immigration in the early 20th century. Again, I used archival material from immigrants' families and from the recently digitized collection of the Library of Congress. This was the main menu. And I was consistently drawn to these images from a century before. While freelancing and raising my daughters, I began compositing old family photographs that I had inherited from my parents. In discovering and resuscitating old images, here is my grandmother and her sister with their mother, my great-grandmother, Anna, who I remember. Creating these images helped me connect and to reimagine their lives. While compositing these photos of women in my family, I discovered physical th characteristics that continued through the generations and that traveled from Ukraine to New York to Baltimore to Boston. I felt closer and more indebted to those who had come before me. By 2000, I had access to fast, faster processors, cheaper scanners, and eventually to, a, in fact, I have to mention that the scanner, that, the first scanner I bought cost $900. You can buy them now for about 50 bucks. I had access to faster processors, cheaper scanners, and eventually to a digital stylus and finally new archival inks and print and paper. Yet I needed to make a living. CD-ROM design had become obsolete. There wasn't enough work in animation. I couldn't get enough print design work because everyone was now a print designer using PageMaker or Quark. And I preferred making pictures anyway. Full-time work led me to web design, about which I knew nothing when I was hired in 2000. Web design was in its infancy. By the late 90s, it was clear that programmers needed artists because artists could deliver, could take the static content and make it visually appealing and compelling. I was hired by Africana.com, which was a subsidiary of AOL Time Warner, as the art director and as a person who loves images, I insisted on a website that was image heavy because I believe that it's the images that draw the user into the story. We were really pushing the limits of what dial-up modems and slow processors could do. Remember, it was the early 2000s. It's amazing what you can design for a 30K animating pop-up banner. We produced many sites, and Roots was such an example, which were photo composites, where photo composites had to work with few colors, small monitors, a specific aspect ratio, and dial-up modems. I incorporated audio into my composites, creating flash animations. I loved creating art and rich multimedia content that celebrated the works of major writers and artists. I'm indebted to AOL Time Warner for this wonderful opportunity. The job was a photo collage's dream job, branding new illustrations, banners, graphics, and mini sites five days a week. In designing websites later in the last decade, I realized that in most cases, even with improved technology, simplicity in design is the key. Simplify, simplify. Before I show you some of my current work, I want to pay homage, homage to just a few of the artists whose work I look at again and again. Vermeer. Every artist should study Vermeer. It's possible that he was one of the first artists to combine painting with photography, deploying a camera obscure. Posters of Magritte adorned my college dorm room, along with posters of the Beatles. 
Victorian ladies in the late 19th century cut up the carte de visites of their friends and acquaintances and created little works of art incorporating these portraits with their own painted backdrops. Some were whimsical, some were quite elegant, but they foreshadowed the rise of surrealism and photo collage several decades later. Photo montage artists that I look at from time to time are artists like David Julian. Diane Fenster created photo collages for various technology magazines in the late 80s, quite a long time ago, and her illustrations always caught my eye. She was actually a pioneer in the field. Terry Gilliam, like Joseph Cornell, used iconic art from the Renaissance in his whimsical animations. Who doesn't remember these from Monty Python opening sequences? And of course, Oscar Rylander. And from Loretta Lux, I've understood that quite often, less is more. Rothko takes my breath away whenever I'm in the presence of his paintings. On the surface, the structure is simple, but the relationship of the colors, the, hev the heavily textured use of paint, and the symmetry of the composition has taught me more than any other artist. To Rothko, I'm eternally grateful for his <coughs> richly packed color fields. And from Jerry Yulesman, I realize that a photograph can make you take a double take, that manipulation of photography can fit into the canon of great photographs, and that it was okay if I didn't particularly like the styles of Lee Friedlander or Gary Winogrand. From Yulesman, he taught me that his teacher taught him, why should the primary moment of truth have to occur when you click the shutter? Kate Brakey photographs and paints over the prints. The colors, textures, and simple compositions of her work always ignites my imagination. Robert Park and his wife Shana Harrison create their tableau in the studio by collaging themselves with appropriated material. Their images ask the viewer to look closer, to wonder, to question, and the, and the images are, view, are beautifully composed. Joe Whaley compose, composites old photographs with insects or flora. I love her incorporation of cross-discipline imagery. And there are many contemporary painters whose work I relish, such as Alex Gross. When I first saw his art here in New York, I wasn't sure if they were photo collages or paintings. Ilya Zoom, whose work I found by trolling the internet. And William Kendridge. Although I don't pretend to understand this genius, my heart rate increases when I see his images, animations. He's a compositor, an amateur draftsman, a political activist, a former mime, a failed actor, and an artist who celebrates the unlikely chance encounter in the studio. Over the past decade, I've created a body of work that pays homage to all those who have come before me, to the countless pictures I gaze at every day, to my teachers, friends, families, and mentors, and to the years of learning that have allowed me to create the kinds of images that were always in my head, but I was inadequate to put onto paper. Book cover design from the mid-90s. I was influenced by the Surrealist, and I played with fragmentation and jarring juxtaposition. In these cases, they bought the they bought the image. They found the image. Return to Warden's Grove. This one I I created for them specifically. And this image is used in branding for the Leonard Bernstein Festival of the Arts at Brandeis with this huge poster. It's about 40 feet long. And I've even supplied artwork, which I created from scratch using 
old photographs that I had, including this one that I took in 1960, for beer bottle labels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is for Smutty Nose Brewery. Like my drawings from so long ago, my photo composite making is often an intuitive in discovery process, a dialogue with the elements within the image. We photo compositors are like stage puppeteers. We create painted sets, moving our sprites around on the stage. We attempt to achieve transformation by readjusting reality. We're like cinematographers. We use still images to try to create the illusion of going back and forth in time and to create the illusion of three dimensions. These two carousel horses were shot with my phone camera at various locations. The circus tent was in Cooperstown, New York. Like most of my image, when I start the process, I have no idea where it's going to go, where it's heading. I was surprised and not disappointed with the result when it was completed several months later. Cosmic Aria. During the process of creating an image, I make mistakes, I experiment, and I play until I'm satisfied. The images I choose eventually are purposeful, not random, although the story, like a dream, may appear to be a random encounter of events. Although this image was completed days before last week's bombing in Boston, and although the background city is New York, I saw it as a message of hope and accompaniment to the last stanza of this poem by W. H. Auden, which I'll see if I can read. I'd really like you to hear it. It's quite beautiful. Defenseless against the night, our world in stupor lies, yet dotted everywhere, ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I, composed like them of eros and dust, be leaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. This is a detail. We acknowledge time passing, but we attempt to capture moments. I suppose that all artists try to control and order their world. What began as a complex image was simplified by the removal in this one of many other elements. Where do the elements come from? In this case, I found an old chair waiting for garbage pickup on Cape Cod. My friend Lisa was sitting on a folding chair in my backyard. I silhouetted the chair. I silhouetted Lisa, cut her her way, and now she's sitting in the old chair. This was a long exposure taken at night in the backyard of a house in western North Carolina. The night light is beautiful. This was a previously created composite of a meadow of trees in the fog with some added textures. I often reuse pieces of my composites, and you'll see them in, in the images here. So this was a collage that I had created that had not seen the light of day until I found the space for it. So I juxtapose these few elements with color adjustments, lighting and blending, and massaging the mask, which is my favorite thing to do, so everything blends seamlessly. I finish the image. At the beginning of the process, I didn't know where the elements would take me. I was drawn to them all, of course, but I was pleased and sur surprised by the finished image. The same background, the backyard taken in North Carolina at nighttime, was used again in a very different image called Catching a Shooting Star. After completing one image, it usually takes a very long time for me to have the psychic energy to start work on another. I keep many images in my arsenal, and in working on a composite, I let them speak to one another. I'm always surprised at the outcome. The tools available to us today give us an infinite choice and range. The genesis of this image was a photo I took in Herculaneum, Italy, where a volcano destroyed the city in the first century CD. Artistic decision Making is often about subtraction, not displaying all one can do. So in this image, I pulled back on the colors. I'm not sure why, but I kept the women's hands a warmer tone, which you can see here. A 
Hopefully, I've also learned that one's virtuosity in the use of a tool doesn't need to be displayed in the creation of an image. Sometimes you just have to kill your babies and get rid of elements that really don't make sense. The objects that went into this photograph called Two Roses came from various time periods and locations, Puerto Rico, Barcelona, old tintypes, dried flowers that I scanned, shots of sky and textures, and my paintbrush. The pyrotechnics available to us today are usually not necessary to tell the story we want to tell. Once you learn how to use most of the bells and whistles, then I think you need to feel confident enough to put them in your back pocket. You probably don't need to use them. Here are some examples of a model in various compositions. I was always experimenting, trying, sketching. The same model, the same pose, different location. The butterfly was found in my driveway. Here are three versions worked on over a period of about six months. The differences might be subtle to you, but they're the kinds of things I obsess about. This one had more light. I was not attempting a photorealistic image, which I'm sure you can tell by examining the various light sources. These people were from two tin types lent to me by a tiny cemetery museum in Lynchburg, Virginia. I was told they had been slaves, not necessarily related, and I used that knowledge in the oh sorry, and I used that knowledge in the creation of the image. Let me go back to this one. I wanted to suggest their dignity and their sorrow and to knit their lives within a larger world that was not yet attainable. I don't intentionally try to make political or social statements in my art, but sometimes it just happens. <coughs> this was an earlier version which I rejected. As you can see, I use metaphor and symbolism. I go into a zone working on an image. I love combining images, juxtaposing, blending, and finessing a mask. I get lost in the process, and I'm sometimes bereft when the image is finished. Here's a close-up detail. This bird was composed of several birds, and the what appears to be the frame was actually created entirely in Photoshop um, using many different textures and, and blending tools. As always, I love to play with the concept of time, connections, and relationships. This is an older image called Looking Into the Distant Future. Again, I was playing with connections and relationships. The hardest part of creating this piece was cutting out all the holes between the many branches and twigs, twigs of the portal.
I don't work in a series. My categories are actually quite fluid. The process is intuitive and the images are primary and each one becomes a world into itself. For a while, I played with figures from Renaissance art. Compositing allowed me to seamlessly combine images from not only different sources, but different centuries and different media. As William Kendridge has said, my workflow is a cacophony of indecision, as you can see by reusing this same figure. And turning him into a carte de visite. As you can see, I tried different backgrounds, never quite satisfied. The artist asks, what if? I don't know in advance. I wallow in uncertainty. Sometimes I know an image is finished, but I don't quite know why. Here's a recent image and variations. This picture was created specifically for the Smithsonian Museum of uh, Space, uh, sorry, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, and is one of about six soon to be exhibited in their recent acquisitions exhibition, which opens in July. This image also, and four others, all deal with fantasies of flight. The impetus for this one, Hovering Child, was a torn and faded photograph of my dad from the 1920s. This was an earlier version, which I rejected when I rejected and eliminated the upper birds. This is my dad's face. This will also be in the Smithsonian exhibit. Since I spend a lot of time on Cape Cod, much of my background imagery and many of the objects are from the Cape. I'm never quite sure where I'm going to end up. Recently, I've returned to my roots, the drawing of faces. I continued to draw the human face. In another life, I might have been a portraitist, portraitist, or more probably in the 19th century, a painter who added color to studio portraits. From Rothko, I developed my own richly packed fields of color. In fact, part of the background of this image was a detail of a painting of Rothko's in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which I shot with my phone camera some years ago. The hardest thing is to create an image that simply tells the story. From Cornell, I created my own version of box assemblages, but mine are two-dimensional. I saw my images as portals or windows into other worlds. This was edited on my cell phone, taken and edited on my cell phone. In case you're wondering, that's Magritte in the background. Magritte. These are sketches, and I often do this when I'm trying to figure out positions. I do very rough sketches in Photoshop to try to understand the relationship of the elements. As you can see, I'm just drawing where the hands, where the birds might appear. Very rough until I'm satisfied. And this is the final image.
What can I do with this old photograph? I'm returning to my love of drawing faces. This one particularly intrigued me. So I cut her out. I spent a lot of time silhouetting, playing with various new backgrounds. First, I placed the face in a rectangle. And I try lots of configurations, mostly just playing, having fun, experimenting. Not quite sure where it's going to end up. I eventually abandoned the checkerboard pattern altogether. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, my question has to do with workflow right now. Some of my pictures are like two gigabytes. And oh. how do you deal with that? I that know, is a you know you get the fastest computer, but I've, I've been breaking them up into different files, but some of them depend on blending modes mm -hmm. to work. So it's been take, I'm spending more time saving files and working on them right two now. Two gigabytes is huge. I, I can't work on a two gigabyte do you, file. Do you work in different files on one picture? Sometimes I have to. I mean, I can't get above one and a half gigabytes. It, my computer is old and it slows down too much. So you have to just, I have to save different generations of the image. The other thing you might consider doing just in terms of workflow is keeping your work in, in groups and um, maybe saving the group as a separate file and then merging the group. Sometimes that helps just to limit it. But I would just make lots of save as and make sure you have tons of external hard drive space. Yeah. There's unless you have a faster computer than mine. I, I couldn't manage that. Thanks for coming. Um, I was wondering, uh, your work in the book publishing, is that something you got through syndication? Do you syndicate your pictures with anybody or do they how do you promote yourself to the book publishers? I'm a really bad self-promoter, uh -huh. so if you had any tips for me, I'd yeah. be happy to. <laughs> um, it's really, no, I don't promote myself. You know, I'm on Facebook, but um, no, I should be doing more. I'm a really bad self-marketer. I don't have, uh, you know, I go, uh, some years ago I started going to portfolio reviews. That was how I met some galleries and started having shows. But it's really just been word of mouth, which is, takes a long time. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm curious about your symbolism and where it comes from. And if, is, it, is it a made up vocabulary that you have? Or does it point to something specific? Those are good questions. And honestly, I don't compl I'm not sure I can completely answer because much of it is unconscious. But I know from studying it that there's certain objects in our culture that are universal symbols. And this comes from Jung and Joseph Campbell and those guys who've studied mythology. Birds can represent journey. They can represent death. And they can also re represent life. So you sort of can pick and choose what you want. And um, butterflies can do the same. I use a lot of flying objects, flying people, as a way to suggest movement. Uh, journeys. Boats definitely are a journey. Some people think that that represents death. But I don't think about that as much. I mean, I think it really is very much of an unconscious um, process. But if you're interested in symbolism, I would read Jung. I think that that would be, this is where he spent his life. <laughs> Oh. Um, so, uh, do you work on multiple projects at the same time? Uh, multiple. And the other question is basically, um, what's your normal day schedule like? Do you work seven days a week, five days a week? I, do you follow a certain routine? Or is it just when ins inspiration hits you, you just, just go for it? Oh, wow, that's a tough one. OK. I work in my house, which makes it very convenient. I don't have to go anywhere to work. So I can work late at night if I want to in my pajamas. I can just move from my bedroom to the next room where my computer is. But I would say I do something 
almost every day. And much of it is not creating, much of it is silhouetting, cutting things away from the background, organizing my files, sending emails to people, updating my Facebook page. A lot of that is that crappy stuff that you have to do. But um, I can't pretend to say that inspiration happens all the time, because for me, it doesn't at all. Uh, there are occasions in which I get really involved in a, pr in, a, in a project, and I am like a banshee working on that particular image for days on edge, on end. And then when I'm finished, I'm often exhausted. It's sort of like giving birth. And then I can't think of another thing to create. I feel like I've done, I'm spent. There's no more creative juices ever. And when that happens, I just do the scut work that we all have to do. So my day is have a cup of coffee, go to the gym. I usually start work around 12, and I work in the afternoon, and um, quite often after dinner. And the schedule changes as my life has changed, as my kids grew up. It was a very different schedule then, but right now it seems to be kind of consistent. Um, I, wish, I, wish it, I, I wish I were more disciplined, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. On an average, how long does it take you to come back for the final oh, sort of get you back? Okay. Um, what he asked is a very good question, which is once I'm done with an image, how long does it take to start working on a new image? Is that your question? That's a very good question. Usually it takes a fair amount of time because for me the creative process is also quite exhausting. And after I've spent a fair amount of time on one thing, I don't really have a plan. I, since I don't work in series, it's not as if I'm going to take it to the next image. I have to kind of create something in my head. That takes a while, and that's why during the interim between working on images, that's when I do the boring, tedious, painstaking stuff that we all hate. It keeps my hand moving, it keeps me in front of the computer, it helps me take pictures, it helps me organize, so that when I'm ready, when the creative juices are flowing, God willing, inshallah, then, um, then I'll be ready, and then I'll have material to work with. Hi. Um, I, do you have, like, a group of people that you talk to about all your variations and, like, cutting off ones to not expose and figuring out what to take further and when to pull back? Like, yeah. do you have a group of trustees that you kind of go to? I, there are maybe two or three around the country that I'll send a JPEG that I'm working on and have them review it and look at it. And that's really helpful because, you know, I work, we, most of us work in isolation. And I, after a while, I can't make a decision. It's really helpful to have other sets of eyeballs. Sometimes I post it, post images prematurely on Facebook and try to get a response that way. Um, the other thing that I do, because I don't like to spend a lot of time, money, and ink printing my stuff until I'm ready, what I do is I email or photo stream the image to myself and look at it on my iPad. And I look at it before I go to sleep, and I look at the image when I wake up, and I carry the iPad around with me. So I'm always looking at the image. And it's interesting because over a period of a few days, without having to look at a print, I'm able to make adjustments to the image. Um, so those are the two methods that I use, just looking at it on the monitor, sending it to other people, a few, very few, posting it on Facebook, and then eventually going back and making revisions if I think they're necessary. And then one more question for um, portfolio reviews, if you don't have series and stuff like that, like, I mean, you, you have the same style throughout your whole entire mm -hmm. thing, but they normally say for series, do you get a lot of of crap for not having like an actual series statement. Oh yeah, statement. I get plenty of crap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I do. But what can I do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when you're coming up with your concept, do you do other stuff than visually? Do you like do detailed research? Um, was it based on things that you've done throughout your lifetime? I mean, you spoke about Jung, his philosophy, and everything is. Mm -hmm. So, to come up with a concept, do you actually like hit the books, do everything else 
to look at? I'm not, I am not that methodical. No, okay. I'm not. What I'm hoping is that the years that I spent in school and my life to date has supplied me with that information. Yeah, I mean, if I have a specific question, I'll do research. But so much of it is, is intuitive and conscious. Um, in the beginning of your slideshow, you had these questions like, is it photography? Is it, um, does it matter if it's mm -hmm. it, photography? What's the label? Right. right, so that was your point then. Like, it, you're not concerned with having a label. No, I'm not concerned, but the marketplace is still, I feel, still concerned. But even over the last five years, there's been a <laughs> kind of diminution of label matters. So I think now there's such a cross-fertilization between analog, digital, photography, painting. I don't think labels really matter as much anymore, but I still do hear it from time to time. So I've been thrown into the world of fine art photography um, really by happenstance. I'm not sure I would have known that that's what it is that I'm doing. I think of it more as painting, and that's really the point I'm trying to get across. I paint. I happen to use a computer and pixels and photographs to paint with. So that's why I'm questioning the use of labels. And if anybody had an idea of what to call it, that would be fine. I'm not sure it really has, has been resolved at this point. Well, I thought this, Fran, I want to thank you very much thank you, Katrina. For, for coming. I thought this was a great wrap up for the spring semester because you've inspired us to find inspiration everywhere from scraps of paper in the attic mm -hmm. or you're photographing pictures in a museum. Uh huh. You've, <laughs> you've said that publicly. I know, I know. I'm probably <laughs> going to get. But the most SWAT team is going to come back to my house. <laughs> That's right. But uh, most importantly, to be inspired by everything you do your past, your history, what you find, have your cell phone with you all the time. And, and ask questions. And I, I think that that's really beautiful. It's a great way to end our lecture series. Right. I'm happy Thank to you be very here. much. Thank you.